Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, we're revisiting a conversation I had with Ian Morgan Cron, who's a best-selling author, a recognized speaker, a psychotherapist and an Enneagram teacher, and that's the subject of this conversation. His book, The Road Back to You, has made the Enneagram accessible to a lot more people. And in this conversation with Ian, he and I talk about what the Enneagram is. We cover what the nine Enneagram types are, how to figure out what your type is and why that's important, how knowing your Enneagram type can help you lean into being a healthy version of that type and not just falling back on the constructed personality type typically associated with the unhealthy version of that type. I know that for me personally, knowing that I am a type five has really helped me lean into the strong, healthy parts of being a five and to step out of the weak parts of being a five and into greater productivity and overall just greater life because of that. It also has helped me learn how to better interact with my wife, my kids, my friends, especially my fellow fives. So I'll get out of the way and say, enjoy this conversation with Ian Morgan Cron. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show Ian Morgan Cron. Ian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Eric. I'm glad to be on. What I knew I needed to have you come on the show to talk about was this thing that has slowly been emerging from a tip of the iceberg kind of awareness from me, which is the Enneagram. Someone comes up to you and is like, okay, what is that? What's your pitch? What's your initial spiel on what that is? So the Enneagram is an ancient personality typing system that suggests there are nine basic personality types in the world, one of which we all naturally gravitate toward and adopt in childhood just to feel safe and to cope in a world that you know kind of feels overwhelming, to make our way in the world. And each of these types, and sometimes we call them numbers, has a distinct way of seeing the world and an underlying motivation that really influences how that type thinks, feels, and acts. So by types, we don't mean like, okay, I'm locked in and I am this and only this. Like it's not a limiting thing. This is more of an entrance into fully being aware of who we really are. And by having a type, it's kind of like, and I think I've heard you refer to it as like auto self or default mode. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that, that one of the objections I tried to head off at the past early mm -hmm. on in live workshops is this idea that the, the Enneagram that I, is trying to pigeonhole or put people in a box, right? In fact, what the Enneagram does is tell you about the box you're already in and how to get out of it. <laughs> that's you know? a, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, so I think that, and I like your the word when you, you were just talking about awareness. You know, Cornell University did a study with Green Peak Partners some years ago. And they did a deep dive into the lives of 72 high-performing CEOs of companies that you know, their bottom line was somewhere between $50 million and $5 billion a year. And they just wanted to find out what was the sort of the soup, you know what I mean? Like what, what, what made these, these, these people so productive and successful in their particular settings? And what they discovered really surprised them, that the key predictor of success, the key predictor was self-awareness. Hmm. It wasn't, you know, strategic planning. It wasn't, you know, any of that. The first key predictor was self-awareness. And uh, some other, Daniel Goldman might call that emotional intelligence. What, uh, however we want to phrase it is to have the capacity to know ourselves, our effect on others, and to live wisely with a, a monitor running on our own inner workings, our, the way we think, act, and feel, make decisions, see the world. Man, if you can know that, you are far ahead of the game. So in terms of effectiveness and driving forward, I think, what it is that we're called to do in this life. When you say that, you know, knowing, this, knowing thyself, <laughs> it sounds very Socratic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It wasn't just Socrates. I mean, it, it, it really goes it, – it's a consistent theme. It's perennial wisdom, right? It, it's just – if we don't understand who we are, we are going to bang guardrail to guardrail through life, not fully appreciating 
that there are differences between people, you know, and that if we assume our philosophy of life or our, the lens through which we see the world is the only one, we're just going to go through life assuming that if someone has a different one, that it's inferior instead of appreciating what it is that they can bring to the table in our lives or in our workplace. A lot of us, if we don't understand that people are all different and have different ways of approaching things, we think that either one of two things, they're looking at things the same way we are, but they're just wrong, <laughs> or right. that they look at things differently from us, but we are superior, and neither one of those really gets us where we want to go. Exactly. Exactly right. And I think if um, you know leaders and uh, thought leaders – you know, or just people that are trying to live well in, in beyond business and productivity in their marriages and their parenting and their friendships and their really in every sphere of their life without self-awareness, we're just not going to flourish. We're just not going to become the people, the best version of ourselves, if I can use that old phrase that may be a little tired now, but our most authentic best selves. So some people out there are saying, okay, what's the difference here between this and, say, some of the other tests that are out there that we've heard of, like Strength Finders or DISC or Myers-Briggs, just to name a few? So I'm a, in addition to uh, a number of other things, I, I'm a psychotherapist. And so I, you know, was trained, you know, not heavily, but enough in statistics and psychometrics. And I'm, so I'm familiar with all of those instruments and I really value them. I think in different settings and for different types of people, all of them are very helpful. Here's what really is the distinctive of the Enneagram. Number one, it's very, very accessible. And oftentimes, and so are some of those. I mean, the, the Myers-Briggs though, oftentimes requires a little bit of a deep dive to really understand it. So maybe the one of the Big things is that the Enneagram takes into account that the human personality is fluid and dynamic, right? Whereas some of those other inventories or personality typologies tend to see the, the personality as static, right? Um, so the Enneagram will teach you how your particular type functions in stress and how it functions when you're in a place of security so that you'll be able to identify, wow, am I right now kind of in a, going in the direction of a breakdown or am I going in the direction of a breakthrough? You, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you can then begin to make choices that are different than you have in the past if you have that self-knowledge. Like, oh man, I'm heading towards stress. What do I have to do to kind of pull up on the yoke here and get the plane you know, back to to this proper altitude instead of heading toward the earth. The, the last thing I'd say, Eric, is unlike those other instruments, the Enneagram is also going to reveal to you that what's best about you is also what's worst about you, <laughs> that it's going to re reveal to you both your blessings and your blights. Whereas those other instruments tend to focus on here are your strengths so that, you know, how can I be more productive or effective, et cetera, all good things. But what they don't talk about so much is the dark side of each type and how that may be undermining the gifts that you actually want to live in. So those are those are three, I think, that are helpful to know about the Enneagram. Yeah. In, in my personal experience, digging into this, it's just rang truer or more rewarding more quickly to me than some of those other tests that I've done. And it, it really comes back to why I really have the core mission of doing this show, which is the whole idea that beyond the to-do list, it's not just about having systems in place and tasks set up, but it has a lot to do with, again, going back to the Socratic thing, knowing thyself and, and knowing that it's not just what you do, but why you do it that matters mm -hmm. a lot often. Yes. And yes. Though, though actions matter, motivations behind those actions are equally important to spend some time with. Absolutely. And I, I would say that uh, to that first point, um, my favorite quote in the book is the statistician George Box's quote, which he, where, in which he says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I just think that's a fantastic insight. So if you've ever taken you know, college economics, you know that's true, right? That all the different economic models are you know, essentially wrong. You go in the business world, you, you learn, okay, that in the academic world, interesting. In real life, eh, 
but you, <laughs> yes. but you got to start somewhere, right? So the model is useful, even though it's not completely accurate. Like a Hagstrom map, remember those? It's like not completely accurate, but they got you there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and so uh, I like to think that all models are wrong. Enneagram, at some level, the you know we're talking about the mystery of the human personality. It's pretty complex. And, uh, you know, the Myers-Briggs is wrong. You know, the question is, are they useful? And I think the Enneagram is particularly useful. I also like what you said about motivations. It, it's, it's really, really important that people understand that beneath every thought, feeling, and action, there's a motivation. And if you don't know what your particular type's motivation is, then you are, there's a kind of a shadow government <laughs> living in your <laughs> life that is making decisions on your behalf that aren't always in your best interest. Yeah, because sometimes we can be on a roll and then suddenly be derailed. I like that you use that, you know, bumping from guardrail to guardrail analogy, because mm. that's what it really does feel like sometimes when we don't know ourselves or have gone too long without checking in on ourselves. I try to do that daily and even weekly as much as possible. The way we are thinking, the way that we're feeling, and the way that that we're acting, especially when it comes to when we're frustrated. I think that's where this really comes into play. Yes. I, I think that frustration is a form of stress, right? When you're frustrated, it usually means that you're running up against an obstacle toward some end that you want to achieve, right? Whether it's in a relationship or in business or in some other area. And what we tend to do when we're on auto self inside these, you know, sort of our personality structure where we're just doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? We tend to, to not understand or move past, to step back from the frustration, take a moment of self-reflection, ask ourselves, hey, now that I know what my type is, what's going on here? so that I can make different decisions and, and not continue to repeat the same ones that have never really worked. And even maybe learn to work within the flow of our natural bent, or like you refer to it, that shadow government. What if we could get the shadow government to be working with us instead of against us? Absolutely. And that, that means how do I acknowledge the dark side and uh, intentionally moving toward the best side of who we are, which we didn't have that option before we had self-awareness and self-knowledge. So that's part of the big benefit of understanding yourself in the Enneagram. So I know that we have more potential than just say the limits or downsides of our default number our auto self, our, our type, our style. But let's walk maybe through these one through nine types and let's go positive and negative a bit on both of those. Let me begin by sort of outing a second objection people typically have. Okay. There are 7 billion people in the world and some of your, your audience might be thinking, well, nine types, that sounds a little simplistic. <laughs> you know. And what I like to tell people is, I compare the Enneagram system to the primary color wheel, let's say, or the spectrum. We know from science that there are an infinite number of reds and blues, right? Shades, contrasts, hues. What I like to tell people is, if you're a one, let's correlate that to red, right? Type one, let's correlate it to red. There are an infinite number of reds in the world. In fact, so many different reds that one might present or look really different from another one. So they'd be like, I'm not even sure they're in the same color family. But the fact is they are. They're both red. They look different. They're unique expressions of red. And so, you know, in every single type, there are an infinite number of expressions, but they all have some variant of the same underlying motivation. So that hopefully removes people's you know, objection that, oh, come on, nine types. That sounds a little silly. Yeah. That, and that makes me uh, think of the box thing you said earlier, where it's not that we're putting you in a box. We're figuring out what box you're in and then getting you out of it. Yes, exactly right. So let's run through the types real fast. And uh, I will give you uh, sort of an upside and a downside to, to each one. So ones are called the perfectionists and sometimes they're called the reformers. The underlying motivation of a one is to improve the world themselves, often other people, to correct mistakes um, and to – they feel really an, an obligation at some level 
to do that for us. And so in its best expression, they're the most ethical, principled, attention, detail-oriented. Think of Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. That's a healthy one. You know, they, they stand on principle. They're people of conscience. And they are incredibly hard workers. Now, on the flip side of that is that ones, when they're not healthy and self-aware, go from wanting to improve the world and other people to wanting to perfect it. And that's just fighting with reality. And if they're not careful, they deteriorate into being very judgmental and critical people because other people never live up to their high internal standards. Twos are called the helpers. And the helpers are the most loving, giving, supportive people on the planet when, when they're healthy. These are people who are incre- almost psychic in their ability to read the needs of other people, and they just want to meet those needs, to, to just be in that space of, of being a, a helper. Their underlying motivation is to be loved and needed, and when they're not so healthy, to avoid acknowledging their own needs, Right. And when uh, they're unhealthy, they can, their giving can be calculated and manipulative because what they're trying to do is they, they believe that the only way they're going to be loved and win approval is by meeting the needs of other people. And so they'll set up scenarios. And, and not, by the way, these are all, for the most part, unconscious behaviors, right? Automatic behaviors. They'll be giving to get in some way. There's always a string attached to the giving when a two isn't very self-aware. It's almost like, I will meet your needs if you tell me, or in some way with the understanding that you will meet mine without my even needing to ask you to meet them in the future. All right, so threes. Threes are called the performers. These are success-oriented, image-conscious people who are, these are people who are wired for productivity, Eric. Nobody is wired for productivity like performers. Mm -hmm. They're, They're motivated by a need to be or to appear to be successful and to avoid failure. When these folks are healthy, like I just said, they get stuff done. They're inspiring leaders. They're charismatic people. When, when they're unhealthy, they live with this belief that the world only values people for what they do, not for who they are inside. And so they can be willing to do things to win success that are not in their best interest and not in the best interest of other people. Fours uh, are called the romantics. I happen to be a four. Th- these people are really the high creatives. They're sensitive. They're highly attuned to beauty and aesthetics and very responsive to them. They're motivated by a need to be understood, to experience their feelings, and I think also to be special and unique. When, when these folks are healthy, they are the the people who bring color to life. These are people who are highly creative in a work setting. They bring very original and unique contributions to the workplace. When they're unhealthy, these people over-identify with their feelings and get lost in this sort of world of subjectivity and never actually execute on their incredible ideas. Fives are called the investigators. Disclaimer, I'm a five. Oh, you know, Eric, just so you know, like I have so I'm going to say two of my closest friends are fives. These are some of my favorite people in the world. Fives are the most analytical. They're also the most private and at times detached people on the Enneagram. They're motivated by a need to gain knowledge, to conserve energy, particularly in the relational sphere, and to avoid relying on other people. Independence and self-sufficiency is really important to fives. Now, when fives are healthy, they can take their incredible, incredible knowledge base and bring it into the world. And by the way, some of the best pioneers we have, for example, in the business world and in other places are fives. They, these are people who are incredible minded uh, people in, in terms of just seeing opportunities and synthesizing information and relaying it in ways and applying it in ways that nobody else would ever think of. Now, when they're unhealthy, though, they tend to hoard their knowledge. They tend to think that knowledge will give them what most people think relationships will give to them, which is support and love. They can become isolated, detached, kind of emotionally unavailable people who watch or observe life rather than jump in and participate in it. 
Yep. Uh, does that sound like you? <laughs> that's I, my wife would be shaking her head. Yep, that's him. <laughs> uh, so type sixes are called the loyalists. Uh, we believe that there are probably more sixes in the world than any other type. Of course, that's speculative. It's not based on any sort of statistical analysis of the population, but we do seem to see more of them than any other type. These people are, when they're healthy, are the most loyal, committed, practical, down-to-earth, and witty people on the Enneagrams. These are some of my favorite people in the world. These people are kind of the glue that holds the world together. They're the folks that really bring a uh, whole tight to our values, our institutions, uh, the things that keep people together in the world. Now, their underlying motivation is these are fear-based people. Their underlying motivation is to feel secure and safe in the world. So these are worst-case scenario planners and thinkers. Um, they are always scanning the horizon, looking for what could go wrong next. And, and they're like fives, they live up in their head and mm -hmm. where they're always planning and thinking, <laughs> you know, like, oh, what am I going to do when? What am I going to do when? The downside or the, the dark side for sixes when they get not into a good space is they tend to not trust their inner guidance system, right? Their ability to make their own decisions. And so they look to outside authority figures, some who are not always great, or institutions or belief systems that will make decisions on their behalf and who will keep them safe and secure in the world. And they just need to learn to trust that they have what it takes to make the right decisions on their own. Sevens. These are some of the greatest people in the world. Fun, spontaneous, adventurous. These folks are motivated by a need to be happy, to plan stimulating experiences, new adventures. Everything is out in the future. The next moment holds what this moment doesn't have. And all of this really is to avoid psychological and emotional discomfort or pain. You know, when they're healthy, again, they bring so much joy and energy to life. These are people who, for them, every day is a snow day full of possibility <laughs> and joy, right? And so they are fantastic people when they're self-aware and doing their work. But when they're not, they can become flitty distracted, monkey-minded, you know, if they be or have they overpromise and and don't fulfill on it, they follow through is very very difficult. Making commitments is hard because they they, they just want to avoid feeling trapped without options and uh, they can be charming and yet if they're if they don't do their work and and allow themselves to experience some suffering in life, they can get a little bit, you know, around 30 you know, what, what makes you funny at 15 makes you shallow at 30. Right. You know? Okay, eights. Uh, eights are the challengers. These are commanding, intense, confrontational, at times combative, larger-than-life presences. So I'll give you an example of this. Take somebody like Jack Welch, the chairman of GE, right? They used to call him Neutron Jack, overly blunt to a fault, and a hard driver, big decision maker, gigantic presence. When, when he or other eights walk into the room, you can just feel the power radiating off them, you know? And it'll feel sometimes like anger uh, when in fact, and sometimes it is, but, it, but in fact, usually it's just intensity and passion coming off them. Um, when they're healthy, incredible leaders they fight for underdogs. They're very concerned about justice and fairness. Um, these are people who, like, for example, I think a Martin Luther King was a very healthy eight. Uh, he was able to channel his power uh, and to self-regulate it, which we all want to do in every number is self-regulate, right, Through because of self-knowledge, and to apply it in the right measure at the right time in the right circumstances, right? When they're unhealthy, they are overly intense, self-indulgent, overpowering, and they're more steamrollers than diplomats, right? And finally, the nines are the peacemakers. I'm married to one. I'm a father to one, so I have a special affection for these folks. They're pleasant, laid back, and just the most easygoing people on the Enneagram. They're motivated by a need to keep the peace and merge with others and avoid conflict at all costs. So what does that mean? It means when they're healthy, these people are natural mediators, and they can reconcile the irreconcilable. Now, when they're unhealthy, 
you know what happens when you want to avoid conflict at all costs. You know, <laughs> peace at all co- peace at all costs is expensive, right? You you have to set aside your own agenda, your own priorities, your own dreams, opinions, and viewpoints to avoid rocking the boat. And so you end up kind of having to erase yourself in order to you know go along to get along, sort of yeah. a philosophy of life. By the way, the underlying motivation for fives, which I didn't say, is that is really it's almost an addiction, a compulsion around gaining knowledge, right? Because for fives, knowledge is power. And it will buffer them from what they perceive will be the overwhelmingness of the world. And for eights, I don't think I said it, which is they're motivated by a need to be strong and avoid feeling weak or vulnerable. So I think that I think that covers all of them. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Thank you for going through that. That I mean, it, it takes a while to go through it. But once people understand, I, I really think that as people are listening, they now have maybe an inkling or, or a gravitation or pull towards one of those nine, whether the healthy or the unhealthy version of it rang true for them. And I think that's what it really was for me was with my five, the the negative portion of it rang truer than some of the other negatives or positives. So I was like, okay, let me look at this one a little bit more. And then I actually uh, talked it through with a friend of mine. And, and even when I went on to your site, which by the way, we need to make sure we mention the exploreyourtype.com, that also gave me a five. And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to go with that working uh, knowledge that that's where I'm coming from here. Uh, I know that you're a four, but I know it probably took you, I think it took you longer. Like, didn't it take a while for you to lock that in? Yes. And I, that's the other, you know, a couple of things there. One is the Enneagram, the best way to learn it is through reading it about it and workshops. Uh, assessments, regardless of whether they're the Myers Briggs, the DISC, anything, any self report assessment has a very meaningful margin of error. I tell people, yes, take an assessment, but because it, it's going to get you familiar with the language of the system. And it, you know, it's got about a 60% chance, though, of getting your number correct, right? Mm-hmm. Because the, the test assumes that a person is self aware enough to answer it completely correct. <laughs> you know? uh, and frankly, that's just not the case, right? Secondly, uh, a self-report assessment can't always really get at the underlying motivation. It's just dealing with traits, which are helpful, but not determinative. So I would say take it, but hold the results lightly and then read a book and try and get to a workshop. That That's the best way to do it. Yeah. And also going back to your primary colors analogy, uh, I, I kind of think of it as – percentages almost where we all have a percentage of every single number. Yes. But it's, this is really finding out which one is the dominant percentage, the default percentage, the one that we, that the one that if we were looking at a pie chart of ourselves took the was the biggest piece of pie. That's exactly right. And that's why traits or characteristics is where people tend to want to figure out their number. The problem is you're going to identify with traits and characteristics inside of every single number. So people often say, I don't know, I'm every number. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) are you looking at traits or are you looking at the underlying motivation that drives the trait? It's the underlying motivation that determines your type. Which one do you most identify with? Now, you're not going to identify with 100% of any type. You know, if you hit so look for the preponderance of evidence, right? Look for, yeah, that pretty much captures me more than any of the other types. Sounds like where I go automatically versus even though, you know, I have access to the behaviors and the traits of all the other numbers. Man, this one really sounds like where I go most of the time. And that was why I think since the Enneagram really is a a tool for self-discovery, and self-discovery can often be pretty daunting because it's this lifting up the rock and looking to see what's underneath. And that's where the dark stuff is. It, that's mm-hmm. why the negative or the unhealthy portion of the five was what really, for me at least, helped me identify which number I was. Exactly. And so I do tell people, for example, at live workshops, you move up and down from unhealthy to healthy and back again throughout the course of a day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just depending on what's happening, how much stress you're under, et cetera. Right. So I think we tend to, you know, describe types on the unhealthy to 
kind of low average space because I think people tend to identify their type by more by what they get wrong than by what they get right. We all know where we get stuck. <laughs> yes, you that's know? it. Yes. I think we kind of do a service to people, even though it's a little painful at times. We feel a little pinched when we hear our type. But I think that's kind of what helps you get there faster. I think that's also for people who then start to get immersed into knowledge about the Enneagram, where it gets to be used maybe as a weapon towards others instead of a tool. Mm -hmm. Boy, and that's that's a great insight. I, I tell people when I do corporate work or let's say oftentimes I speak, you know, in corporations or I speak in nonprofits or churches or synagogues, I mean wherever. I just tell people in communities of any kind, you know, the Enneagram, the knowledge you gain from it should only be used to encourage people, never used to dismiss or to label or categorize or, you know, like sometimes people say, oh, you're being such a six and then storm out of the room. That is weaponizing knowledge and using it against people versus helping them to grow into their best selves because you know their path, right? Their transformational path. And so I think that's a great point. Let's use it for the good, not for our own purposes that are not always you know, great. One of the other things that has, for me personally, been very helpful is this idea that when we're creating, when we're producing productivity, or as we're creating when it comes to artistry, that we draw from this well within ourselves to create out of the questions or discussions or struggles that we're having internally and having this tool to help us work through that makes us a better artist or a more productive person. Totally. I could give you probably a one sentence. I don't know. I haven't really thought about this about productivity challenges for every single number on the Enneagram. I mean, it, it it's not too hard to do because you know, obviously, we, we've done a lot of work in the corporate setting and, and just helping people realize this is where I'm going to struggle. Well, and I think that's the thing is like – and again, when I talk to people on this podcast all the time, there's no one right way. There's no silver bullet that just is applicable across the board because everybody's different. Everybody has different mm -hmm. percentages of all these different traits, healthy and unhealthy. And so – Knowing yourself, this is, I mean, again, I, I feel like I'm a broken record or an echo here, but like knowing yourself is that true way of finding out how you can best do your work. But not only that, I mean, have the best relationships and the best life possible. To go back to that George Box thing, I think it's a key predictor of success, not only at work, but in relationships, in spirituality, in our workplace, in our relationship with ourselves, parenting, et cetera. It, it, it's just so important that because man you talk about a drag coefficient <laughs> <laughs> that's great not knowing yourself is gonna really slow down the boat that that is a great uh i'm, I'm having a mental picture of like a diagram that's showing where the res the wind resistance on a plane or on a boat with the drag in the water is is happening that's great yeah well that's oh, because God. you're a five <laughs> <laughs> there you go you went right to seeing the analytical dimension of what i just said isn't that fascinating that yeah it's dead on jeez oh I, let's see i could talk about this for a long time but what's great for me is the fact that i can sit back <laughs> oh gosh this is so five of me uh i can sit back and hoard the podcast episodes that you've had that were directly related to your book as well as now the ongoing podcast that you have where you're having conversations with uh, I'm sure you're going to have more people uh, than I've had on this show. I've had Rob Bell on the show before. That was a that was an amazing kickoff. Yeah, he's interview. something, isn't he? Yeah. And so I'm just super excited to to get people uh, a, a, an awareness of this, first off. And I'm sure as people were listening, they started to gravitate towards a number. But even if they didn't, let's wrap up and direct people towards where they can go. I know that your site exploreyourtype.com is a is a first step where they can start to do a very simple analysis. Uh, yep. Where else would you send them? Obviously, your book and podcast. Yeah. So The Road Back to You, An Enneagram Journey to Self-Discovery is the book. Obviously, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you know, books are sold. There's a workbook that goes with it that's wonderful for individuals and for groups, by the way, which has done very well, which I'm thrilled about. Secondly, you can go to typology 
typologypodcast.com. So the name of the podcast is Typology, T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y. And if you just go to typologypodcast.com, you can see all the past episodes and subscribe. You can write on, obviously, on iTunes. The podcast that I did previously was a promotional asset for the book. So there's only about 25 episodes, and that was called The Road Back to You podcast. And that, that too, is a, a wonderful resource because in you know, both podcasts, you're going to hear people of all these different types talking about their own experience. And that's a powerful way to learn yes. about what your type might be. The other place, obviously, people can go to is iancron.com, I-A-N-C-R-O-N.com. And uh, you can also access the assessment through typologypodcast.com. There's a button they can oh, jump on right there as well. Perfect. Ian, this has been very healthy for me to have this conversation with you. And I think it's going to be the same. It's going to be very healthy for others to explore this even if they've had success with other assessments in the past, this is another one. This is a new one, a new one. Listen to me. This is an ancient new one that <laughs> will help you yeah. out as well. And again, it's going to help you know who you are and how you are motivated to move forward and have success in all areas of your life. Ian, thank you so much for being here. Man, this was a pleasure, Eric, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. That's another podcast crossed off your podcast listening to-do list. I hope that even if you were already familiar with the Enneagram, that you found something beneficial out of this episode. I know I like to geek out about the Enneagram because it really has been a turning point in the last, I would say, five years, three to five years, somewhere in that period where I learned about being a five, dealt with being an unhealthy five, have made steps towards being a healthy five, and it really has made a difference. Next week, we will revisit my second conversation with Ian and talk about the productivity hangups of each Enneagram type. You don't want to miss that one. If you found this conversation helpful, would you do me the favor of sharing this with somebody you know needs to hear it? That person that you know, they've heard the word Enneagram, they wanted to dive deeper in. This is a great starting point for them. They can listen to something that's short and sweet and get the gist of it to learn how to jump in even deeper and find out if it's more for them or not. To do that, just hit the share button on your podcast player app of choice where you're listening to this in right now. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for listening and I'll I'll see you next episode.